Hello once again. Thanks for joining us on Astronomy Daily. I'm Andrew Dunkley, your host. On the program today, we're going to look at how the sun will die. Scientists have made some predictions. The star Betelgeuse, 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 whatever you want to call it, uh, has dimmed by about 60% and they think they have a theory as to why. Up until now, it's been a mystery. We're also going to look at the rock structures on Earth because they hold within them the oldest signs of life. And we're going to also look at uh, the radiation signatures on trees, but uh, they don't answer all the questions. And that's a big mystery in itself. That's all coming up on this edition of Astronomy Daily. Astronomy Daily, the podcast, with your host, Andrew Dunkley. Joining us now to talk news and a few other things perhaps is our AI reporter, Hallie. G'day, Hallie. Hello again, Andrew. I see you're having flood issues again. Yes, I'm afraid so. We've had a lot of rain over the weekend, which has filled all the upper catchments and all that water has been racing downstream in the major rivers in this district and they're all converging. So yeah, we've uh, we've been lucky here in Dubbo so far, and uh, and again, uh, even though they've closed a few streets down on the uh, riverside, uh, nothing significant for us to worry about. But uh, around us, it's uh, much worse. Lots and lots of rescues. Over two hundred people having to be rescued uh, in uh, districts south of us, and a few people getting caught up in it in their cars. And yeah, one wonders when it will ever end. This has just been normal for us for several months now. It's uh, It's been quite terrible. Hopefully everyone will remain safe and things will dry out soon. Yeah, I hope so too, Hallie. Uh, it's interesting though the way the floods work around here and uh, people might be interested to understand. West of us and northwest of us, the land is very, very sparse and very, very flat. So when the rivers rise out there and the rivers going through where I live all sort of merge into that um, what's called the Murray-Darling Basin and when the water gets out of the rivers there and gets out on the landscape, it spreads for hundreds of square kilometres and it takes months to flow away. So people who live on those big stations, those big properties out there are quite often stuck in their homes for, um, you know, two, three months at a time and th- and that's what's happening. Around here it tends to be a lot faster because we're on higher ground and the rivers rush through rather quickly, but uh, it's it's all going to end up out there eventually and that's where the trouble uh, happens. A couple of towns that are on the um, junctions of two or three river systems, so they, you know, when they do have floods, they get them big, really big. Anyway, um, yeah, it might be a different story in a few days. You just can't tell. Uh, all right, Hallie, we better get down to business. What's happening in the news? <laughs> First up, we look at Canada. For the first time in history, a Canadian rover will be sent to the moon and will help in the international search for water ice in the lunar soil, which is key for the future of human space exploration. This rover is the outcome of decades of building and refining Canadian expertise in rover technology. It will inspire an entire generation to set their sights on distant destinations in our solar system like Mars. The rover will carry six scientific payloads, five Canadian and one American. It will perform meaningful science and demonstrate key technologies that will lay an important foundation for subsequent Canadian lunar exploration. With this contract, Canadensies will continue to innovate in areas of technological strengths for Canada, like robotics, advanced vision systems and science instruments. The annual Templeton Prize which recognizes outstanding contributions to affirming life's spiritual dimension, was this week awarded to Brazilian Marcelo Gleiser, a theoretical physicist dedicated to demonstrating science and religion are not enemies. A physics and astronomy professor whose specializations include cosmology, 60-year-old Gleiser was born in Rio de Janeiro and has been in the United States since 1986. An agnostic, he doesn't believe in God, but refuses to write off the possibility of God's existence completely. He said, and I quote, Atheism is inconsistent with the scientific method. Atheism is a belief in non-belief. So you categorically deny something you have no evidence against. I'll keep an open mind because I understand that human knowledge is limited. 
Gleiser joins Desmond Tutu, the Dalai Lama and dissident Soviet author Alexander Solzhenitsyn as recipients of the prize. Recently, a team of astronomers found evidence that stars and planets actually grow up together, forming at the same time in a solar system's life. Interestingly, their clues for planets' infancy came from an unexpected place, the dead core of a former sun-like star, known as a white dwarf. Amy Bonser, an astronomer at Cambridge University in the UK and lead author of the new research, said we have a pretty good idea of how planets form, but one outstanding question we've had is when they form, does planet formation start early, when the parent star is still growing, or millions of years later? Many of the 200 white dwarfs the team observed were rich in iron, pointing to iron-rich asteroids. To give an asteroid an iron core, things need to be pretty warm, and the most likely source of heat is the decay of a radioactive form of aluminum. But this material, known as aluminum-26, can only exist for a little less than a million years. So, in order for these asteroids to contain as much iron as the astronomers detected in the white dwarfs, these space rocks had to have formed pretty early, at the same time as the star itself was being made. The research is described in a paper published in the journal Nature Astronomy. NASA announced that the Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment, Capstone, spacecraft, a 12U CubeSat, completed a 16-minute maneuver, placing the spacecraft into a near-rectilinear halo orbit around the moon. Data from the spacecraft showed that the maneuver took place as expected. Capstone is the first spacecraft to fly in the NRHO, an elliptical orbit over the moon's poles at altitudes ranging from 3,500 to 71,000 kilometers. It is also the first CubeSat to go into any orbit around the moon. And that's the news, Andrew. Thanks, Hallie. We'll check in with you at the end of the show. Now to a story about the sun. The sun is the subject of much science and much interest. We have uh, orbiters keeping an eye on it. We've uh, been studying it since humanity looked up. Uh, But scientists have now made predictions about what the last days of our solar system will be like and when it might happen. Uh, Previously, astronomers thought the sun would turn into a uh, planetary nebula. Uh, which is like a big bubble of gas and dust. Uh, That was until evidence suggested it would have to be a bit bigger, a bit more massive. Now an international team of astronomers have flipped on that and found that a planetary nebula is indeed the most likely uh, demise of our sun. Now the sun's about 4.6 billion years old, uh, gauged on the age of other objects in the solar system that formed around the same time. Uh, Based on observations of other stars, the astronomers predict it will reach the end of its life in about another 10 billion years. Um, There are other things that will happen along the way, of course. Uh, In about 5 billion years, the sun is due to turn into a red giant. The core of the star will shrink, but its outer layers will expand out to the orbit of Mars. So um, everything in between will be engulfed, including us. Woohoo! By that time, we, we won't be around. In fact, humanity only has one billion years left uh, to find a way off this rock, and that's because the sun is increasing in brightness by about 10% every billion years. Now, um, that doesn't sound like much, but the increase in brightness will end life on Earth. I didn't know that. (laughs) I'm a bit disappointed. Uh, Our oceans will evaporate and the surface will become too hot for water to form and will be kaput. So that's what they think is going to happen. Uh, We've got plenty of time, but we do need to figure out a way to get off this planet if we don't destroy ourselves in the meantime. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. Now to another star called Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. Uh, There are several ways of pronouncing it. Fred's always correcting me because I call it Betelgeuse, but that's what I've always known it as. Now in late 2019, it dimmed uh, quite significantly by about 60% and they wondered why. It was quite a mystery. Uh, And it it's, it's probably impossible at this stage to find an exact cause, but new research has come up with a uh, potential solution, and that is a wandering companion. 
may have played a role in the process. Uh, by swinging close to the giant star, this, uh, this particular interloper, as they're calling it, may have raised a tidal bulge, causing the surface of Betelgeuse to dim. Now, while this scenario can't explain the full amount of dimming that's been observed, it may have triggered other effects on the star that made the problem worse. Betelgeuse is one of the most easily recognisable stars in the sky. You can see it as bright as um, uh, as the bright red shoulder of Orion, and it's usually the tenth brightest star in the sky. Now, if you were to place the red supergiant in our solar system, it would engulf all of the inner rocky planets and stretch from the sun to the asteroid belt. Uh, now, Betelgeuse is almost ready to die. It's uh, um, immense because it stopped fusing hydrogen at its core a long time ago and switched to fusing helium. Uh, surrounding that core is a shell of burning hydrogen. Uh, with the intensity of fusion reactions in and around the core, the energies push the outer layers of the atmosphere outward, forcing the star to expand. Um, now, red supergiants like Betelgeuse are among the largest stars in the universe by volume. So naturally, astronomers, uh, astronomers were very surprised in late 29 when it began to dim for no apparent reason. Now, um, they've, they've kept very good records of Betelgeuse going back half a century and they could not find a precedent for the 2019 event and now they're thinking perhaps it was caused by a, a wandering, as I said, companion. That companion may have been a black hole. Whatever caused the dimming uh, also must have come from a situation outside the star itself rather than being due to some fundamental change in Betelgeuse's internal operations. Now, layered rocks in Western Australia are some of Earth's earliest known life, according to a new study. The fossils in question are stromatolites, layered rocks that are formed by the excretions of photosynthesis microbes or photosynthetic microbes. The oldest stromatolites that scientists agree were made by living organi organisms date back 3.43 billion years, but there are older specimens in the Dresser Formation of Western Australia, stromatolites date back 3.48 billion years. Uh, however, billions of years have wiped away traces of organic matter in those stromatolites, raising questions about whether they really formed by microbes or whether they might have been made by geological processes. Well, a new study has come up with a verdict. It was ancient life. According to uh, Kieron Hickman Lewis, a paleontologist at the National Natural History Museum in London, he said, we were able to find certain specific microstructures with particular layers of, uh, within particular layers of these rocks that are strongly indicative of a biological process. The findings could have implications for the search for life on Mars, of course. And finally, um, we're doing a, a, a lot of um, uh, evidence-based discovery today. A um, cryptic chemical signature of unknown origin uh, hidden for centuries inside the trunks of Earth's trees just became even more mysterious. Uh, in the last decade, scientists have discovered traces on Earth of six intense bursts of radiation known as uh, Miyake events scattered over a period lasting 9,300 years. The most popular explanation is that these mysterious signatures were left behind by massive solar storms, leading, to some, uh, leading some scientists to warn that the next Miyake event could cripple the world's electrical grid. And we've talked about that before. It is certainly something that emergency services around the world are keeping in mind. But new research published in Proceedings of the Royal Society uh, suggests that more than just solar flares might be behind this uh, this radiation record. The finding underscores the need for further investigation into these strange bursts, which could potentially harm our society in the future. Uh, bottom line is they know they happened, but they can't account for the intensity, and so more study will be required. Makes you pause, doesn't it? 
I will pause now and uh, just just tell you that if you want to chase up these stories, you can do it on our uh, website, spacenuts.io. Click on the Astronomy Daily tab and you can read all about it and several other stories. You can even subscribe to the newsletter and get it delivered for free. All right, uh, we're going to wrap it up there. Hallie, anything before we go? I was just thinking about God. You humans seem to be very divided on this issue. Where do you stand, Andrew? Well, you've just demonstrated uh, the difference between humans and artificial intelligence because you never ask people that question. You just don't. Uh, But in answer to your question, uh, I'm not going to say anything. But I will say that I did have a conversation once with a a man of the cloth, that is a, a, a priest, and I suggested to him that it could be both that uh, the universe was created by the Big Bang, but who created the Big Bang? And it got us to talking, and he actually suggested that uh, I might be on the right track. The things we can't explain, like what caused the Big Bang, could be, in fact, the, um, the work of a, a deity of some kind. You could sit down forever and nut this out, and no one would ever agree, but it's, it's an interesting concept to consider, I suppose, Hallie. Does that answer your question? No, not really. Good. That was my intention. Hmm. Bye, Hallie. Bye. Until next time, this has been Andrew Dunkley for Astronomy Daily. Astronomy Daily, the podcast with your host, Andrew Dunkley.